time. And I just wanted to um, let you all know that this is our first plant clinic that we are providing um, to the public in support of the Plant Nova Trees campaign, which kicks off this September. And as you can see on the slide, it's a, it's a, um, a celebration of trees that launches this fall and will go on five years to um, educate the public on the importance of native trees, why native trees are good to plant and good to have in your, in your habitat and in your landscape and their importance in the food web and um, their importance to uh, supporting the, um, the health of our watershed here in which we all live in the, the large watershed as the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And um, just a, um, a definition, a native tree is one that's evolved within a given local ecosystem and participates in the entire interactions of every living thing in that ecosystem. And um, is, everything benefits every other organism because of that. Um, this is our lineup of our plant clinics that are in support of that campaign. As you can see, um, lots to choose from. And then we even have some that we've done in the past. So for instance, this summer we did a, an oak gall plant clinic and oak pest plant clinic. So you can even go back um, to previous plant clinics and view those recordings. But these are the ones that we've planned into the future beginning today. And uh, today's agenda, Celebrating Native Oaks, will uh, start off with Carrie Bundy, um, who will talk about how to identify them, how to distinguish between those two major oak groups, the red oaks and the white oaks. And then John Crotzer will um, speak specifically to white oaks and the importance of them in our ecosystem. And then Nancy Miller um, will uh, speak about um, the Red Oaks, and then we'll have Q&A. And um, our, I'm your Zoom host and moderator, Liz Train, and Zoom support by Sandra Oliver. We are all Extension Master Gardeners in either the Fairfax County Master Gardeners Association unit or the Green Spring Gardens um, Master Gardeners Association. And these plant clinics are sponsored by the Virginia Cooperative Extension, program, and that's out of Virginia's two land-grant universities, Virginia State University and Virginia Tech. And the whole purpose is to um, educate the public using science and research-based information on sound horticultural practices that are um, friendly to the environment and wildlife, as well as, um, you know, maximizing the benefit uh, of whatever it is you're growing, whether it's a food crop, an edible crop, or a um, you know, food for wildlife or just in your, in your landscape, in your own gar garden. So I've introduced to you who we're, um, who's presenting today and, um, and what our theme is. So I am going to go ahead and turn it over to um, uh, Carrie Bundy now. Whoops, sorry. Hold on. Let me pause recording here for a second. Recording. So I'm going to turn it over to Carrie Bundy, and she's going to talk about identifying oaks. There we go. So I'm Carrie Bundy, and this is just simply about uh, identifying the differentiation between red oaks and uh, white oaks, both of which are found in the Northern Virginia area. Uh, so oak trees are all in the beech family. Um, but the genus uh, is differentiated by subgenuses for white oaks, the Leuco balensis, bal balenus, uh, and red oaks that are Quercus subgenus Erythrobalanus. Um, the oak leaves are differentiated by points and lobes. White oaks have lobes, uh, the leaves are rounded, there are no bristles on the ends or at the apex, which is the point of the leaf, or what would be the point if it wasn't lobed. And red oaks um, have both points and bristles. You can see in that northern uh, red oak, that Quercus ruba, uh, that there are little fine, almost needle-like protrusions, and that's at every point. 
Uh, these are just some varieties of oaks. Uh, most of the photographs in this presentation I took in and around my neighborhood. Uh, so this willow oak, you can see both the, uh, how the bud is grouped at the end. I don't have a pointer, uh, but, uh, and then also, thank you, if you can look at that, yes, the bud, uh, there's always a grouping. Red oaks typically are more pointy uh, in their bud uh, at that, at the terminal end, uh, where the, the, um, the white oaks are more rounded. Also, if you can use your pointer and go up the leaf just north of the words, uh, on the willow oak. If you uh, trace up um, the leaf in the center, please. Yes, you can see at the very end of that leaf, yes, that there is the bristle at the end of that. Uh, and it differentiates it as being a red oak in the red oak family. Uh, the Quercus uh, falcata, the southern red oak, um, I don't have any leaves that are really close up to see the bristles, but you can certainly see the points at the end uh, of each of the yes. Uh, and then the white oak at the bottom, uh, those are nice rounded leaves. This is a pretty young, only about a foot tall white oak. Um, lots of leaves, the way that they're grouped. Uh, also, I think you can kind of tell that they're alternate. On all of the oak trees, uh, leaves are alternate. So they come off the branch, not directly across from each other. That would be opposite, but they are alternate. Yes, thank you. Uh, the oak bark, uh, the young oaks are smooth and kind of silvery brown. Uh, that's both for red and whites. But when red oaks mature, uh, the bark tends to look more fissured uh, and it gets considerably darker. Uh, the white oaks often have um, light gray bark and can, it can look scaly. Um, and then I have some examples of bark, I think, on the next slide, yes. So again, uh, on the left is the uh, some juvenile or immature young black oaks. Uh, the top slide is um, a really fissured looking um, northern red oak. Uh, I took some pictures, the leaves were in a previous slide. And that bottom one is a really large, probably diameter of something like two or three feet uh, of that Quercus alba or white oak. Um, hey, Nancy, could I just um, interject something here? Our, our uh, Fairfax County uh, Division of Forestry, uh, Forester Jim McGlone, talks about um, when he, he speaks to identification between the, the northern red oak and the, and the white oak, if you look at, the, at a mature red oak, it almost looks like ski slopes, um, you know, intersecting ski slopes coming down. And the white oak almost looks flaky, large flakes that actually are open to one side. And one interesting thing is um, bats will roost in the white oak underneath the white oak bark, those little brown bats. Um, and so it, it provides a good place for, for wildlife, uh, a place to rest. So I just thought I'd interject that. Thank you. Uh, and the fruits and or their acorns, acorns are oak fruit. Uh, these are just examples. It's a little early in the season for some of the red oak fruit. I'm not seeing, I can't see it from the ground. Uh, the white oak fruit has been more easy to see. Uh, these acorns, they cluster um, and, um, I don't know what I was gonna say. Just basically they're, they're quite large and quite visible right now on at least on uh, the Eastern white oak or the, the Quercus alba. Uh, I'm not seeing them right yet on some of the red oaks in my neighborhood. Uh, it doesn't mean they're not there. Uh, they just are kind of, they're mature later in the season. Uh, so they're not quite as visible to the eye to me yet. Um, white oaks, uh, the biggest differentiation because quite frankly, after examining trees, uh, in and around my neighborhood and, and uh, looking at leaves, um, some of them are kind of hard to tell. Uh, that, but one of the big differentiators is that white, or, white oaks, their, air, air, their acorns, excuse me for being tongue-tied there, their acorns require only a single season to mature. They also typically drop earlier in the season. Um, they don't have as many tannins in them, so it tends to be sweeter. Uh, and certainly foragers will, will gather um, white oak acorns uh, for, for, to make flour. 
Um, also, they're quite popular with hunters. I visited a, a couple of them. I'm not a hunter personally, but uh, it appears that when you Google white, white oak acorns, uh, that a lot of uh, deer hunting organizations or wildlife management organizations um, collect acorns to use them for um, distribution in areas to attract and monitor wildlife. Uh, but particularly, there's a lot of wildlife, turkeys, deer, who, who prefer the white oak acorns. Uh, red oaks drop acorns every year as well, uh, but they differentiate in that it takes more than a season, it takes two seasons for those acorns to mature. So they will flower certainly and uh, get fertilized, but it takes a whole nother season, um, another growing season before that acorn will mature and drop. Uh, they drop later in the season, so uh, late October uh, and in November uh, that they'll be dropping um, and they're typically bitter. Uh, so not quite as delicious to wildlife, but certainly when it's available, um, and when they're, they'll eat them. Um, lots of carbohydrate in them. So for energy store, um, uh, people don't seem to like them as much because of the bitter tannins. Uh, and this is just how acorns and I, I could get uh, from between Virginia Tech uh, and in my neighborhood, I could get um, photographs for white oak, um, for the cycle for a white oak acorn. Um, an oak tree is wind fertilized. Uh, we're all familiar with those catkins that hang uh, and we see big, they almost look like tumbleweeds to me, um, you know, when, in, when summer begins because they all gather together thanks to the wind. Uh, but the flowers are very close to where the, the leaf actually joins the twig. So that right hand uppermost uh, photo is of the female flower on a white oak. The dangly parts uh, are the catkins or the male flower. So when the wind comes through uh, and, and picks up that pollen, it's distributing to other white oaks. Uh, oaks are pretty notorious for their hybridization. Uh, they're going to, um, the pollen for one white oak, it can be a Quercus uh, alba, can certainly fertilize um, another white oak. Um, a post oak or a, even a chestnut oak uh, and make acorns. Um, and red oaks will also cross hybridize with other or hybridize with other red oaks. Again, these are just images from, um, from my in and around my neighborhood. So here's the bark of a, it's a fairly young um, Southern red oak. Uh, it's in one of my neighbor's front yards. And I feel like that the leaves, especially the ones that are hanging with the blue sky behind, kind of look like turkey feet um, or kind of have a Dr. Seuss type flair uh, in the way that they're designed. I realize he had nothing to do with the way red oaks make their leaves, but uh, it's still just kind of interesting to me how offset they are. And it's kind of hard to tell at the base uh, of the leaf, uh, but they don't tend to be uh, symmetrical. They're slightly offset. That main vein on one side, the, the um, lobe of the leaf is going to be a little bit larger than on the other side. Uh, this is chestnut oak. Chestnut oaks have, in, uh, again, that light scaly but deeply ridged um, bark. It almost looks like triangles coming up off the tree. Uh, the shape or, or a pyramid come in the bark ridge. Um, the leaves don't look particularly, um, they look more like an elm almost or a beech. Uh, they are in the beech family, uh, but there's no bristles on the end of a chestnut oak leaf. Um, so it's a white family, a white oak in the white oak genus. Um, also the acorns mature every year. Uh, so this is a branch that had fallen off the tree. The cap is beginning to, um, just from dehydration, separate from the actual nut. Uh, but again, uh, they're large. They're probably uh, about the size of a 50 cent piece. Do we still use 50 cent pieces? Anyway. So this is a picture um, that is just across from uh, the neighborhood in which I live in. And I did not do, um, I didn't look it up. It's in uh, a book that I've got that came from a Washington DC organization that's about trees, um, but it is not a native tree. It's a, a sawtooth oak. 
It has interesting bark. And even though it looks like it's got bristles on the end of its leaves, it is considered a white oak and they call those hairs instead of bristles. So I'll just um, add to your, your comments there, uh, Carrie. Um, one of the reasons this tree is listed as invasive in Arlington and Alexandria, um, and it, it is a threat throughout um, the Southeast, uh, Southeast forests is, it was introduced and it's now naturalized extensively. It's still widely sold by um, nurseries and landscapers and installed by developers because it's a very rapid growing tree and it begins producing acorns, um, large amounts of them at uh, five years of growth. And so it tends to outcompete the other native oaks. So just wanted to highlight that for folks. Um, you know, the food is of wildlife value, but um, the threat of the tree to, to outcompete in spaces and in the forest of our uh, more, more valuable uh, native oaks is, um, is of concern. So both red and white oaks uh, uh, contri contribute a lot to, to the ecosystem. Um, I, I did quote Doug Tallamy here um, in one of his lectures that he talked about that there are more than 100 vertebrates that eat acorns. Um, it's not just mice and blue jays, but turkeys and foxes and deer and all you know various sizes of, of vertebrates that eat them. I suppose humans could be listed there as well. And that there, there are more than 900 species of Lepidoptera, so that's moths and butterflies that utilize oaks. They're not necessarily utilizing the oaks as adults, as butterflies and moths, except as a, a larval host. So they're, they lay their eggs on these and, and their caterpillars um, eat the leaves uh, of the various species of oak. And why that matters is because caterpillars, uh, pound for pound, um, are transferring more of the energy from the plant to all the other animals. There's a lot of different animals uh, that eat caterpillars. Uh, they don't have sharp and pointy parts, so they are, especially for the songbirds, and um, they are feeding, uh, adult songbirds are feeding uh, those caterpillars to their babies. Uh, because it's like a little sausage uh, that it, so a lot of calories in in a nice digestible package. Um, so it's an incredible uh, incredible boon to the ecosystem. Uh, and then finally, there are years uh, that seem to be variable about weather, uh, where a, a tree uh, will produce both red and white oaks will, will have a mast year. And it's just the abundance of acorns that are produced. Uh, and it's a tree's um, strategy uh, to produce so many acorns that there are more than can be consumed. Um, so even with uh, when you've got birds and um, small mammals, who are storing uh, and burying these around, um, you know, just around in the soil, uh, that they're gonna forget where some of them are. Uh, also, there's just gonna be too many for them to manage. Uh, and so the likelihood that we'll get more oak sprouts uh, are, is greater. So just by simply overproducing essentially that it causes the predator, predator satiation uh, that we're going to have more opportunities or the oak trees are going to have more opportunities for more sprouts to survive. Um, I will say that what I didn't include in, in my PowerPoint were things like deer, deer really enjoy uh, oak seedlings. So the strategy is not just for um, a few of these to uh, become seedlings, but also to become seedlings and then to actually become trees as well and not be eaten. Uh, the suggestion um, by uh, a couple of the websites that I visited was to actually cage uh, seedlings that you want to grow where they're growing so that, that the deer can't get to them. So they can get to a point uh, where they will survive being, being uh, browsed, uh, just some of the leaves by the deer as it grows. And then resource books, uh, again, uh, I'm, I am a big Doug Tallamy fan. Uh, this is his latest book, The Nature of Oaks. Uh, Common Trees of Virginia, uh, the first web resource is the PDF link or the link to the PDF of that book. Um, the other guide that I used uh, was the Casey Trees Species Guide. Uh, and while it 
helps identify trees, it did not note uh, that that sawtooth saw -tooth oak uh, wasn't invasive. And I don't know why that didn't come as a link. So screenshotting these uh, is worth the effort. Uh, again, that top one is uh, the, um, the uh, forestry guide. Um, and then there are interesting, the, the next one is really about, um, actually it's another book. Uh, it might be the third link that isn't actually showing up as a link. Uh, it talks about the differentiation of the various kinds of forests that occur in Northern Virginia, both Piedmont and coastal, uh, and what grows here, and also things to companion grow uh, with oak trees, things like blueberries and uh, virgin or um, pieweed and Joe pieweed, and um, uh, just flowers that are going to grow well, and shrubbery that's going to grow well underneath an oak that's not going to jeopardize the nutrients for the oak. Um, again, uh, the Away Garden is a a podcast uh, and it's worth again listening to it's 26 minutes uh, it's Doug Talamay's website he's asking people to participate uh, in in posting what they would like uh, or what they're doing to help uh, support the ecosystem or eco gardening uh, the Smithsonian magazine is the article uh, that they did with Doug Talamay um, and earlier from this year, it's uh, the same lady who runs Away to Garden. Uh, that's her article from the New York Times. Uh, and then Plant Nova Natives, uh, as this was supposed to be about uh, uh, species that uh, work and live here normally, that evolved here with the insects, uh, the Nova Natives organization and website not only has the latest edition of their uh, Nova Natives book, but also um, about plants, again, that would grow well in and around an oak. Okay, thanks so much, Carrie. Do we have any questions for um, Carrie on um, identification and the general um, value of, of oak trees? Okay, if not, then we will continue on and we'll hear from John Kratzer. Um, who's with Fairfax County Master Gardeners Association, who's going to talk about white oaks. Over to you, John. Uh, thanks, Liz. So um, uh, my presentation is going to be more on uh, uh, just some fun facts and some interesting uses of white oak and why they're important to our ecosystem. Next slide. So uh, in doing my research, um, this is the thing, obviously, that stuck out to me the most. Uh, in, the, in the book, Remarkable Trees of Virginia, there's an arborist who went in there just said, white oaks are Virginia's finest trees, period. And you'll see that quote quoted in a number of different pieces of literature when talking about trees in general. Um, they're just big, they're magnificent. Uh, as you can see in this picture here, their limbs sometimes seem to defy gravity. Um, and uh, they are a great uh, native tree uh, here in Virginia. Next slide. So a little bit about white oaks. Um, I mean, they're found all along the East Coast, as far west as Texas and Minnesota. Um, and uh, as Carrie may have mentioned, the white oak, it gets its name from the pale bark and the kind of the pale underside of the leaf. Um, and when you hear in a, in a little bit about more about the red oak, you'll see how that's different um, than the white. Um, they have a very, very large tap root, and that helps anchor these huge trees um, that, that have these limbs that seem to defy gravity. But it does make transplanting them very difficult for all but the youngest of trees. So that's something for gardeners to keep in mind. If you're going to be uh, planting a white oak, um, number one, you're probably not going to get too old of one uh, because of that size of that taproot. And number two, you're going to want to make sure you put time into planting where you're going to put it uh, because it's not like a perennial that you're going to not like it in one spot and move it in the fall. Uh, where, where you put that white oak, you're going to want it to stay there. Um, they produce both male and female flowers. The male ones are uh, a bane to a lot of people in the spring, the catkins that, uh, as I think Kara mentioned, they kind of form these tumbleweeds that you find all over the place. They are wind pollinated. Um, and so they end up blanketing our whole state with this thin coat of this green, yellow, golden pollen, uh, much to the chagrin of a lot of allergy shot sufferers. Uh, but they are, um, uh, they do cross pollinate quite a bit with other oaks. Um, as, was, as was mentioned, but I think we all uh, have seen and or experienced uh, 
there are massive amounts of pollen produced in the spring. Next slide. So the, 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 the biggest thing about them, uh, both literally and figuratively, is white oaks can live for a very long time and they can grow very, very tall. Um, they reach over 80 feet in height often. Um, their crowns are even wider. And uh, part of the reason that's possible, again, is because of that large tap root. Um, they can live well over 500 years old. Um, interestingly, the largest uh, white oak on record right now in the United States is in Virginia. It's in Brunswick, Virginia. Uh, it's 90 feet tall. Uh, it's 120 foot wide. Um, it's almost 28 feet in circumference around the base of the trunk. Uh, and is estimated to be well over 500 years old. Um, and if you go and you take a look at the, the website I have listed there below at Virginia Tech, um, it's this one is in part of the, there's a big tree program in the United States. Uh, they have a scoring system. I'm not going to pretend to fully understand it, but it has to do with the height and the breadth and the circumference and several other features that go into a formula and they give them a score. Um, and this white oak is uh, by far the highest scoring one in the United States. It gets a lot of visitors, I understand as well. Um, uh, why they're important, uh, they're important for a lot of reasons, but one of them, uh, and probably the most important one to us, you know, home gardeners and, and master gardener, um, uh, master gardeners is the importance to wildlife. Um, so like most master gardeners, we all have, we all want Doug Tallamy to be sainted. Um, and he has uh, done a lot with oaks as just was just mentioned. Um, as Carrie just mentioned, um, his latest book is about oaks. Um, the, the research I did, I used a little bit of an older book of his, and he had identified it as serving as the preferred host for 534 species of moth and butterflies. That number seems to have grown. Uh, but anyways, it's still a lot. Uh, and, it, and even back then, when it was only 534, it was still the most of any other uh, plant family. 90% um, of Virginia's songbirds depend on caterpillars that um, are, are from these pollinators, these 534 pollinators above. Um, as, so as, as mentioned before, these caterpillars are a very important source for food uh, for not only songbirds, but for other animals as well. Um, they're white oak, the white oak acorns, they're very nutritious, a lot of protein, fat, and energy in them. Um, at least 90 species of animals, of vertebrates in Virginia, um, depend on white oak um, acorns uh, for food. Next slide. Um, it also is very important for commerce. And uh, that's something we don't talk a lot about as home gardeners, but there's something about the white oak grain that is very, very, uh, it's close grain. It's a very heavy and strong wood. Uh, and it's got a, a, a light brown color that many people find um, appealing. So it's very prized in carpentry and woodworking. It's used a lot in um, hardwood floors, but it is also extremely watertight. So white oak is the wood of choice when you, um, you find a whiskey, uh, whiskey barrel makers or wine barrel makers. Um, when ships used to be wooden, it was, it was the wood of choice for shipbuilding as well because of its uh, water tightness. And obviously we don't see too, too many wooden ships today, but, um, but it was a very sought after wood um, for that activity as well. And then finally, I just list a couple of the resources as the Master Gardeners will often say, we, we encourage people to visit uh, .edu sites in order to, to have science-based information. Um, and uh, dendrology, the, the study of trees, there's a really great uh, Virginia Tech dendrology site um, that I've included on here. Um, Fairfax Gardening, a number of people have uh, done research or science-based uh, articles on oaks. Uh, Doug Tallamy's uh, older book, Bringing Nature Home, um, as well as the Remarkable Trees of Virginia, um, which is a great book and, and uh, again, focuses on these large trees. So I see that there was a question. Um, Oh, sorry, it was a comment uh, by Kerry. Never mind. Um, uh, so that's it for White Oaks. If anyone has any questions, please let me know. Okay, do we have any questions for John? If not, I am going to um, go ahead and share Nancy's Red Oak discussion.
And over to you, Nancy. All right, thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the red oak or Quercus rubra. It's a member of the, of the beech family. It can grow 65 to 80 feet high and wide. It can grow up to two feet per year. It prefers full sun and acidic soil. It's adaptable to urban conditions. It takes 25 years to first bear acorns. And it's valued for its shade, fall color, lumber, and habitat. On a red oak, the leaves are simple, arranged alternately on the twig. They're five to nine inches long with slender petioles, up to two inches long. And if grown in full song, sun, these uh, petioles will be red. You can see it at the base of the tree there. There are seven, uh, let's see, the sinuses of the lobes the dips in the leaves are U-shaped and the tips of the lobes are bristle-tipped, almost like a holly. The upper surface is dull green, the lower a paler green. Stems, oh, I'm sorry, the trunks are straight and they have an attractive branching pattern. The twigs are stout, hairless, reddish green to brownish, uh, greenish brown. In winter, buds are clustered at the ends of twigs. They are oval in shape with a sharp point, usually chestnut brown. The bark on mature trees is brown to nearly black, broken into wide flat topped gray ridges. These ridges have been described as ski runs. And I thought I use this picture because it's very clear the ski runs coming down the mountain. The root system, uh, could we go back one more? Back a slide, thank you. The root system is relatively fibrous, making it easier to transplant than other oaks. This is why it's readily available in nurseries. You have more success with it. Okay, next slide. Female flowers on the top slide are inconspicuous and appear in April and May at the base of twigs. As the leaves emerge, pollen is produced by drooping elongated male clusters called catkins. It takes two years for the acorn to mature and acorns are only produced every three to five years. The tree needs to be at least 25 years old to start producing and the mass and uh, massive producing Production starts after 50 years of age. The acorn is fairly large, three quarter to one inch long, and the cap is shallow, only covers about one quarter of the acorn. They are produced singly or in pairs on short stems. You can see that in the bottom one. Pests and other things. Next slide, please. If the right tree has been planted on the right site, most problems can be averted. However, if a red oak is stressed, you should check for chlorosis or yellowing of the leaves and oak wilt. There are insects that can also affect red oak, including the oak saw fly, giant bark aph aphid, lace bugs, the acorn weevil, the walking stick, and the red-necked caterpillar. Remember that this is a native plant in this region and therefore relatively resistant to most pests. If you feel there is a serious problem, consult a certified tree arborist. Next slide, please. Commercially, red oak is grown in managed tree lots by the lumber industry for use in furniture, housing, cabinets, flooring, pallet lumber, and railroad ties. And actually, the red oak is named for the color of its wood, not the leaves, which is, of course, what everybody remembers. Botanically, Native Americans used the bark medicinally, and acorns are, were an important food source after the tannins were removed. In World War II, it kept thousands of people alive in Europe. 
Ecologically, red oaks support a wide variety of lep lepidopteran. Acorns are eaten by woodpeckers, blue jays, small mammals, wild turkey, wild -tailed de white tailed deer, and black bears. They provide shade, remove carbon from the air, have edible fruit, and provide invaluable habitat and food source sources to wildlife. If you'd like to learn more about red oak, here are some sources. And the next slide is my references. Okay, Liz, back to you. Okay. Do we have any questions on red oaks for um, Nancy?